This is a 58 year old female who came to me for help with cardiovascular health, specifically hypertension, high blood pressure, varicose veins, menopause symptoms, and weight retention. Just a little background information. She's under a lot of stress right now because she's taking care of her mother who has Alzheimer's disease. So another issue that she had was she was concerned if she had a risk for getting Alzheimer's disease. So we later on in the video, I'll show you how we tested for that. She also has other issues. She has constipation, has a bowel movement every two to three days. And for her high blood pressure, she's currently on a medication, a beta blocker, metoprolol, which is controlling her blood pressure. But other cardiovascular issues she has is varicose veins where she has apparent spider veins and then some larger varicose veins on her legs with no edema. Her weight, uh, she is tracking it with an app called NutriSense and she is struggling to eat 1400 calories per day, which is kind of a low caloric intake. Um, and she's struggling with that. And I have followed up with her since we had our very first encounter. So this treatment plan I have already given to the patient. And at that time she was um, taking one of the GLP-1 agonists. And while she is on that, she is has absolutely no appetite. She has to force herself to eat. And this is the only way that she has been able to lose weight. In fact, she lost about 10 pounds since over the span of about two to three weeks from the time I first saw her by taking this uh, GLP-1 agonist, terzebatide. As far as hormonal symptoms, she has been experiencing hot flashes for the past 10 years. Um, these hot flashes affect her sleep. Um, she has to wake up two to three times per night to go uh, urinate, and that's a affecting her sleep. Other hormonal issue is she has low libido and some vaginal dryness with intercourse, but not uh, dry feeling in daily life. Before she came to see me, she, uh, like a month prior to seeing me, she started on uh, hormone therapy, um, some compounded medications, which we'll talk about later on. We got the labs back, I made her a plan. So without further delay, let's jump right into the labs. Here's the salivary hormone testing. We did the comprehensive panel, which includes four cortisol readings throughout the day. And here are the results. Her noon, evening, and night cortisol levels were good, but she almost had an inverted curve in the morning reading. And this is indicative of a low cortisol in the morning, which could have an effect on how you wake up in the morning, but her symptoms do not align with these results. She has no problem getting up in the morning, doesn't have low energy in the morning. So I would attribute this possibly to, she was has been traveling from the East Coast to the West Coast. Her, her body clock is set to the East Coast time setting and then by the time she came to the west coast and took this test it had only been about a week so maybe her uh, the hormones that wake you up cortisol didn't resync but she doesn't seem to have any symptoms related to this low morning cortisol next on the saliva hormone test we can see her estradiol progesterone the ratio of testosterone DHEA levels and her estradiol was high. Uh, I mentioned earlier she had just started a month ago using a, a compounded estradiol cream and apparently her dose is too high because she should be within this supplemental range over here and her value for estradiol was 37. So that's way above the range. So we addressed that in her plan. Her progesterone is okay. It's within the supplemental range at 1953. Um, I did make a little bit of an adjustment to that, which we may have to make an adjustment later on in the future. The, 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 the trick is to get this, this progesterone to estradiol ratio as close to 200 as possible and at 
the same time relieve the symptoms. Now, she's taking this huge dose of estradiol and it's not making her symptoms of hot flashes worse or and it's also not improving those symptoms. So we may need to do some things to adjust this ratio, which lowering the estradiol will increase this ratio. So that's what we did in her plan. Her testosterone is good at 43. She's not using any external testosterone, so we'll go by this reference range. And she's within the range. She's at the higher end of the range of testosterone, probably because she is taking uh, what I would call a higher dose of DHEA. Usually for women, I give a five milligram. She's taking 25 milligram of DHEA, although her, her actual DHEA value is not elevated. So I'm just wondering if maybe a good amount of this DHEA is converting into testosterone as it does. Next, let's take a look at the food sensitivity report. Now I ordered this test because she was having constipation and she also has a lifelong history of asthma. I wanted to see if there were any food sensitivities possibly contributing to her asthma or her constipation. And what we found on here is that she reacted to many different foods. Everything she reacted to is, is highlighted in blue. If we look at the, the key down at the bottom, blue is a class one, it's a low reaction. Yellow is a class two, which is a medium, and red is class three. She didn't have any yellows or reds, but she had a lot of blues. Now, a lot of these could be false positives because this is an IgG food panel, meaning this is not a frank allergy. IgG food sensitivity test is not testing for allergies. It's testing to see if you're having this specific type of immune response, an IgG immune response to food. And then from that information, we usually do an elimination diet for a month to see if it resolves any issues. In her case, we'd be seeing if it's helping with the asthma and if it's helping with her constipation. Now, I'm not going to have her eliminate all of these foods she reacted to so many different foods and it's just impossible so i had her eliminate the ones that i have seen the foods that i have seen cause problems which would be peanuts and dairy so we'll have her avoid all milk derived products and peanuts 100 percent for the next month and then everything else on here that she reacted to would just She's aware of this now and she's going to not eat that much of any of these foods and certainly not eat them more than two days in a row. The last order we tested was a blood test through LabCorp. So let's jump right into this. I wanted to take a deeper dive at her cardiovascular disease risk. This test is the NMR lipo profile. It takes a magnifying glass and actually counts the number of LDL particles. And if, if those are high, it just shows you that you have a higher risk of um, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or ASCVD. In her case, her LDL particle number was very good, 741. It was actually, it was actually below the reference range, which is good. Her HDL, which is a protective particle, um, high density lipoprotein, it was good. It was 35.2 above the reference range, so that's protective. And then the size of the LDL particle also could be a risk factor. The smaller the size of the LDL particle, the more likely that it could incorporate within the, the, the wall, the arterial wall, and in the future cause plaque formation. In her case, her small LDL was good. It was 277. So that was good too. Um, LDL size was actually a little bigger than the reference range, which is good. Here's a way I explain to my patients how cholesterol could cause hardening of the arteries. So imagine, imagine you have your house and there's a bunch of bees outside and you're inside your house and you don't want those bees coming inside. So 
you seal up all the cracks in your house and the only bees that are able to fit into your house now are those very small bees that could fit through the very small cracks. So that's the LDL particles. And then the number of bees outside means there's a higher probability that some are gonna be smaller and that those small ones are gonna get into your house. Once the bees are in your house, it's causing problems. That's just like the, uh, the LDL cholesterol getting into the arterial wall causing problems and then um, you get hardening of the arteries. Now, HDL, high-density lipoprotein, is like a beekeeper. The beekeeper's going out and collecting the bees up. So that's a kind of a simplistic way to look at your cholesterol. Here we did a, a comprehensive metabolic panel, which shows fasting blood sugar, and shows your, your liver health and um, other... Uh, Tissue, indications of tissue destruction, which that was normal. And then these would be your how well your kidneys are filtering. Next, as I mentioned earlier, we assessed for Alzheimer, uh, Alzheimer's disease risk. And there is a test called the APOE genotyping test. And somebody who has a higher risk of getting Alzheimer's disease earlier in life would have an E4 copy of this gene, E4, E3. You, you get one, one gene from mom, one from dad. So a higher risk would be an E4, E3, and then the highest risk is E4, E4. Now, she had E3, E3, so she does not have the gene that uh, shows Alzheimer's disease risk. I also checked for an MTHFR mutation. You've probably heard about this through um, podcasts and whatnot. Uh, MTHFR gene is a gene that codes for some enzymes that helps your body to activate folic acid. Um, some people with cardiovascular disease may have mutations in this gene. And about 30% of patients I check for this gene have some level of mutation, but here, she didn't have any mutation in either of the genes tested, so that was good. I checked her hemoglobin A1C, which was 5.6%. It's not a concern at 5.6. Just if it gets to 5.7 or above, we start to have a concern. You could see the range pre-diabetes is 5.7 to 6.4. This hemoglobin A1C tests your average blood sugar over the past three months. Hers was good. Uh, thyroid. We tested, I always test TSH, free T3, and free T4. If you get your thyroid tested from your doctor, request to have at least your TSH, free T3, and free T4. Not total T4, not total T3. It has to be free T3, free T4, because this is testing the actual amount of thyroid hormone that is available to your tissues. So the test is available, free T3, free T4, and TSH. If your doctor is only testing TSH, then ask them to do the free T3 and free T4 as well. And hers was good. Free T4 was good, TSH was good, and for some reason on LabCorp results, they put the free T3 on another page, but rest assured that one was good too, and I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. And I think I think I also tested reverse T3. We'll, we'll check that too. I also tested folic acid, which was normal and vitamin B6. She actually requested that I test some, some of these vitamins. Zinc was good. Uh, oh, here it is, the reverse T3. So your thyroid gland makes T4, and then T4 goes into circulation to the rest of your body to where it needs to go, and then that gets converted into T3, which is the active form. Some people under certain conditions will their T4 will get converted into something called reverse T3, which has no purpose in the body, um, and it's an indication that things aren't working as efficiently as they should. Now, we'll really only see reverse T3 be an actual issue if somebody's in frank starvation or if they are um, under a very, very lot of stress, because when your body's under stress or under starvation, you want the metabolism to slow down. We don't want it to speed up, and thyroid hormone speeds up the metabolism. 
So in this case, her verse T3 was actually higher than I want it to be. I'd like it to be around 12. There's actually a ratio you could calculate and that comes to about 12 nanograms per deciliter. So she was a little high on that, but let me skip to it. Here it is. But her actual T3 was 3.5, which was like right in the reference range. So she shouldn't be feeling any symptoms associated with having elevated reverse T3. I'm wondering if her reverse T3 may be a little high because she's under a lot of stress taking care of her mom who has Alzheimer's disease, or it could be due to the fact that she has been having such limited calories in her diet. But it doesn't seem to be an issue. It doesn't seem to be affecting her energy. In fact, she calls herself Energizer Bunny. So that's not an issue. We also checked vitamin D and her vitamin D should be around 50, but it's 35.9. So I made sure that she's taking a good dose of vitamin D on her treatment plan. And vitamin B1 was good. That's thiamine. Vitamin C was good. Kind of at the lower end of the range, but it was still okay. If somebody has, if somebody has a really deficient deficiency in vitamin C, they're going to have, um, signs of like, uh, maybe they're going to get like more gums or bleeding or maybe like sores on their lips, connect things that are related to connective tissue. There's a condition called scurvy that happens if you have low vitamin C, but hers was okay. We checked vitamin B12, which was 418. I really like this to be at 500, but it's still okay. 418. I also checked her um, copper and then one of the, the carrying protein that carries copper around just to see if maybe she was deficient in this and that was causing issues with her, um, the integrity of her blood vessels resulting in the varicose veins. But she was good on copper. And then I checked fasting insulin to see if that was an issue. No, she's producing enough insulin, not too high, not too low. If you want to have your magnesium checked from your doctor and they, they're going to order the test, make sure they're ordering the RBC magnesium, which stands for red blood cell magnesium, because that's a better indication of your body's amount of magnesium than just testing blood magnesium tests. So make sure they do the RBC magnesium. We tested hers and it was really good. I also tested selenium and that was really good as well. So everything I just talked to you about with concerning the labs, I wrote down for my patient here. Now jumping into her treatment plan here. Um, like I said about the food sensitivities, we're gonna have her avoid peanuts and dairy and then just be aware of those other food sensitivities and try to avoid those. She's, she's tracking She's actually tracking her um, cat caloric intake already. So I told her with her app, she can um, also see if any of these foods that came up on her food sensitivity test correlate with any of her symptoms. I also added in light therapy to um, help to reset her circadian rhythm. And this could help with that morning cortisol. This is also a good way to if you're traveling to, to kind of reset your circadian rhythm. Next are her medications and dietary supplements that I recommended. Now for the, I didn't find anything on her lab test that would indicate why she's having varicose veins. So it's likely just genetic. It's, it's very normal to develop varicose veins for a lot of people. And there's some genetic changes in some of the um, things that the genes code for, some of the proteins and the connective tissue just isn't as um, robust as it was when we were younger. And so the, the walls of the veins could become thinner and they're under the pressure, they're more likely to bulge and the valves around the veins are more likely to, to bulge too. And then that's how you get the varicose veins. There are, there are some things you can take that could help with that. Horse chestnut is one herb that could help with that, at least help to slow down the progression. And so I'm going to have her take that at this dose. I also added in 
product called Super EFA Forte, which is a really good dose of fish oil. Specifically, we're going to have her take that for the, the DHA that's in it because that helps with cognitive health. Her prescription that she was on before from the another practitioner for the hormones, which was too high, was a compounded cream that she got at a compounding pharmacy. And it was something called biased, which means it has 50% of estriol, that's E3, and 50% of estradiol, which is E2. It also had progesterone. I stopped her on that one because her dose of estradiol was too high. Applying 1.25 milligrams of estradiol cream every day for most women is too high of a dose. And we even saw that on her on her salivary hormone results. So what I did was I split up, I split up the um, prescription. So now she's getting estradiol in a patch, which it's still bioidentical because it's estradiol, but it's commercially available. So this one's actually FDA approved. It's made by a pharmaceutical company. It's bioidentical and it's in the convenience of a patch. So now she is to apply this patch, which is like a mid dose range. I'm probably going to even lower this more in the future, but we're starting at 0 0.1 milligrams and it's a convenient patch. You put on twice per week, put on a patch for after a couple days, you remove it, put on another patch, rinse and repeat. And then I split up, like I said, I split up her cream, took the progesterone and had it. She, ha, now she has it in her own, on its own by itself and this still needs to be compounded at a compounding pharmacy because the progesterone cream bioidentical progesterone cream is not commercially available so we have to do it through a compounding pharmacy and the only the only um, forms of progesterone bioidentical progesterone that are available commercially are uh, 100 and 200 milligram capsules we may, we may go up to that, but I lowered her dose of the cream down to 75 milligrams. And the cream and the capsule are usually pretty comparable whenever we're looking at results on the salivary hormone test. So I lowered her down to 75 milligrams of progesterone to apply to her skin every night before bed. And when I, when I compound my creams, um, I found that if you have the patient apply a full gram, it takes a lot to rub all that in. So I try to put everything down to half a gram. So it's just a matter of adjusting the concentrations. So in this case, it's 150 milligrams per gram, but I'm having her apply only half a gram. And then I added on her, the, I added on vitamin D for, uh, to get her vitamin D up to 50. I have her take 4,000 IUs per day with food. This is the liquid form. And then I added on Hawthorne extract to also help with cardiovascular health. It helps, could help with the integrity of the, the blood vessels. On the first visit, I had her start on a probiotic called Pendulum Acromancia. And this is a probiotic which helps to um, improve the the mucin layer, the protective layer of the digestive tract, and it's also been shown in some studies to help with um, with blood sugar and weight loss. So I had her start on that for a month, and then she was already taking the DHEA 25 milligrams. So I kept her on that, and then she was on the terzepatide injection, which is the GLP-1 agonist for weight loss. Now she was concerned when, when she actually came in for this plan already, she was concerned about how effective this terzepatide is because she's even at the lowest dose and she has no appetite. She's have to, having to mentally force herself to eat one meal a day, but she says this is the only way she has been able to lose weight. So I told her once she gets to her target weight, which we calculated, which would give her a BMI of about 23. Once we get, she gets to her target weight of 166 pounds, 
then we'll get off of the terzepatide and see if she can maintain with just lifestyle. And that's it for her plan. I usually follow up about five weeks after I see my patient, after I give them their plan, to see how they're doing on the plan and then make adjustments. Like I said before, I'll probably have to make some adjustments to her hormone prescription. Um, usually I retest the salivary hormones after my patients have been on the hormones for three months. If you have any questions, concerns, please go ahead and leave those down in the comment section below. I thank you for watching. Subscribe for more. Take care, guys.